continuing our, our bird streak, I have a few for you today. First is the female red-winged blackbird. These are not so far afield as Australia, this one. And all the rest are from Washington State. Uh, you can actually see red-winged blackbirds uh, around Northfield, though mainly I saw them in the spring and summer, haven't seen any lately. We have a juvenile yellow-headed blackbird, uh, like many blackbirds, like sort of marshy, reedy areas. Uh, next up, we have another bird that likes to be close to water, the least sandpiper. I mean, it may be a small bird, but that just doesn't seem like a very nice name to me. I would, I would not like to be known as least Aaron, for example. I have a slightly bigger sandpiper, the Baird sandpiper, and then a. Uh, Pacific Slope Flycatcher, uh, looking very curious and a different one, enjoying a nice tasty snack. All right, thank you very much. Lovelace does a lot of, a lot of cool things. Um, one thing that I wanted to call your attention to uh, about the, the course webpage is that on the calendar uh, for each day, um, there are notes posted that uh, kind of an outline of, of what we went over that day, and that's the the link from the the topic of each day links to those notes. So for today, there is an outline up up uh, kind of for what we're going to go over. Um, use that to to review to follow along as as we go. I uh, just wanted to make sure uh, you knew that that was available. Um, all right, so we're going to start out with. Uh, a bit of practice. And uh, for that, we will need our cards. So, so first we have uh, this review question. There's some lines assigning uh, variables. And when you're thinking about this question, one thing to remember is that assignment is a one-time operation that is setting up some value and, and label in memory. It's not establishing some permanent equality that affects all, all future operations. So in particular, A equals 2 here is a sort of one-time operation that affects the memory slot labeled A. It's not going to kind of go back in time and affect previous operators. Yes? I just have a question about that, because um, in the next line, for example, you use A again, so it does remember it, but then as soon as you change the assignment, then it has a new. Yeah, so, so each line of this program is doing uh, kind of computing some value on the right-hand side of the equals, and then putting it in a slot of memory and giving it a label. And so our second line here uses A. If we change A later, we're not traveling back in time to, to change some operation that we already did. Uh, so take a couple minutes and, and work through what you think this will, this will print out, uh, and then we'll see what we're, what we're thinking. So we seem pretty unanimous that uh, we're going to have 2, 15, and, and 25. Uh, the, the majority has this one correct, and uh, the, the first answer there is if changing A to 2 went back and changed what these previous operations did, then that's what we'd expect, but once the assignment puts something in, in memory, that's, that's what's there unless we specifically modify what's, what's in that spot again. Yes? Is there any way, suppose I actually wanted that to change all my subsequent calculations? Like, what if I made a change and I realized I did something wrong and I'm like, oh, do I have to go manually change all these things? Is there any way in Python that you could like force it to be like, oh, go look back at that? Or is that just how Python works, I guess? Uh, so just using normal numbers like we, like we are here, there is not a way. Like, this is how numbers behave in Python. It would be possible to set up a sort of different kind of way of representing this data that would have uh, this behavior that, that you're describing, but that would take quite a, a significant amount of code in order to, okay. to set it up like that. Other questions?
All right, let's just do one more practice. Make sure we're all feeling good about how this is going to work. All right, so most of us are thinking it's 4 and negative 12, but maybe it could be something else. Go ahead and discuss with your neighbors how you uh, got to the answer you put. All right, if you'd like to change your answer, you can hold up your card to select a new one. All right, we are indeed converging on four and negative 12. That's what this, what this will do. I'm gonna volunteer to uh, explain how you work through this. Yes. Yeah, so um, in the first line, I did the division first, so it's going to by two is five, and then the subtraction eight minus five is three, so that gives us an x value of three. Uh, then on the next one, I did the x plus one first, because it's in parentheses, so three plus one is four. Uh, and then with the negative, I, I did the negative first just because ultimately it doesn't really matter, but like, uh, we have the negative 3 times 4, which is negative 12, which makes y negative 12. And then we know that x is 3, so x plus 1 is 4, so x becomes 4. Exactly. Uh, any questions on this problem? All right. So uh, I want to return to our weather program from last time. Uh, we're importing this get per temp. Uh, we know that this is giving us a temperature in Celsius. So we defined our kind of hot temperature threshold as 80. We converted that to Celsius, printed it out, uh, and then computed the difference and printed that out, uh, ran the, the, the program and uh, indeed saw our, our converted temperature and our uh, difference printed out. So one thing that I would like you to consider is that we did this sort of uh, getting our data, converting it, and then printing out this difference. If we don't count it, if we don't count this print, uh, we have kind of four four lines, four different steps that we ask the the uh, computer to do. And we could compare this to a version where we do everything in a single line, kind of shove all these steps together on a single line, and uh, print. The difference between the current temp and the hot temp is uh, uh, 80 minus 32, because that's our, our, um, uh, our, our hot temp. And we would have get cur temp minus our hot temp converted to Celsius. Um, degrees Celsius. So what are what do you see as some some differences or, or maybe some reason why we would want uh, the kind of uh, longer version or or the shorter version? Why don't you take a few minutes, discuss with your, your neighbors kind of what you see as maybe some relevant differences between these two approaches. All right, so what, uh, what are some, some things that came up as you were, were discussing these two different approaches? Yes? So the top version, uh, it's much more hard to like get it wrong because you're going step by step at the same time it'll take way longer, and, the, and people who are often reading your code and stuff, it'll take them forever to read it. But at the bottom, it's more concise for people reading your code. But if you mess up like one number or some form of syntax, you risk messing with the entire code. Yeah, those are all, those are all great points that uh, 
It's going to take longer to write the top version. At least there are more characters to, to type. Um, but we've done it step by step, easier to spot an error. An error is going to be in one of the steps, not all of them combined in the same, the same part. Um, it's an interesting point about which is easier to read. Like this may depend on who is, who is reading it. Um, would uh, would uh, anyone like to make a case that the top one is, is easier to read? Yes? Yeah, I mean, I would say, like, listing things out step by step, it does make it easier to really understand that it's not, like, something you're 100% comfortable with. Yeah, I, I think that uh, one, one thing I might note is that the top version we can tell that there's a temperature and then a temperature in Celsius. And so it's like just the variable names sort of like tell us what's going on. We just have to recognize the, the formula in the bottom one. Otherwise, it's, there's nothing there that, that would tell us there's a temperature conversion. Yes? Or I guess this was a different point. Uh, sure. Uh, with the, or the bottom one, um, it, more like there's less fewer variables and it's like more hard coded in. Um, so in the top one, you have the hot temp is set to 80, but if you like decided that like in two years you wanted to change that to 85, it would be a lot easier to go in and change that 85 there and change the variable across the board. Whereas on the bottom one, it's in the equation that in the print statement, so it would be a lot harder to go in. And if you have that 80 in like five different places, it would be a lot easier to change. Spot yeah, that's a, a, a great observation on the value of having a named variable for something. We can go to the one place where we assign it a value and change it there, and then everywhere that variable shows up is affected, versus just using the number 80 all the way. There's like no easy way to go to one place and change all the 80s to something else. So yeah, that's, that's for sure an advantage of kind of breaking it down into these steps. Uh, other thoughts? Yes? If you're running a program, it would be easier for you to just write out step by step that way you can call those variables out in the future if you need them. For example, or if you wanted to write that time times minus uh, the hot time C, which would be the hot time five, you can simply do that, and it will save you a lot of time in writing. Then you will have to physically write all of that yeah, we've given a name to something, and we can use that to refer to it if we if we need it need it again. That's that's uh, like thinking about doing kind of doing more stuff with this code in the future. That's where we start to see maybe having this step by step is going to make kind of future code that we write a lot easier. Other thoughts? Yes. I guess a lot of the times um, when you're writing code, sometimes you're not the only person interacting with that code, especially if you're writing a program for like that in your job or something. So if other people are like going through your code for whatever reason, right, in the bottom one, they're going to have a little bit more trouble trying to figure out what you did versus in the top one, if they were trying to debug it or deal with it or do anything with it. Yeah, so there's this idea when we're writing code of uh, sometimes it's called maintainability or readability or just like the ability to for someone else to understand and modify code that exists. Um, and one way that I describe this top version is I would describe it as self-documenting. And what I mean by this is just by the variable names that I've chosen, the code sort of tells you what each of these lines is doing. There's a current temperature, there's a hot temperature, there's a hot temperature in Celsius. Um, and when we think about writing good code, we want to think about making it readable, making it understandable to other people, but also maybe more importantly to yourself one day, one week, one month, one year from now, uh, I, I can tell you that it, it's very possible to go back to code you wrote and just be completely baffled. Like, what was this doing past me, spent no effort in like writing down what this or, or making this easier to understand, and, and I, I'm 
I'm not grateful for what past me has done. Any other thoughts? So one way that I describe this top half was self-documenting, but there are actually ways to explicitly document our code. We can actually write uh, things in the files, um, and we do this using something called a comment. So a comment is any line that starts with a hash is a comment and Python is going to ignore all comments when it's actually running the code. So it's a way to kind of put stuff in your .py file uh, that's for someone reading the code, but is not like trying to give instructions to the computer. So some good things to document. Name, date, and purpose are like useful things to document. So uh, at the top of this file, uh, I might say um, Aaron Bauer, September 20th, 2021, CS111 class demonstration. And it's just, it's good practice to put at the top of the file the author, when it was written, what his purpose is. Makes it easy for someone looking at this file later to kind of at least know a little bit about what's going on. Also, If your program can be kind of broken down into separate logical steps, uh, those are places that you could comment. So I might kind of break my four lines into a step that's like getting the data, convert to Celsius, output difference, just to kind of make it clear to someone reading the code, here are like three distinct sort of logical steps that the code is going through. And a strategy I personally find useful when I'm writing code is to actually write these comments with the separate logical steps first, and then fill in the code for each one, so that I kind of think through what are all the kind of logical things I want the program to do, and then I can fill in the code uh, for each one. Help Helps me kind of uh, wrap, wrap my head around uh, a program I'm trying to write. Something that's uh, always a good idea to document is any line or, or lines that were particularly tricky to write. And the way you might think about this is anything that you can imagine, that, that say you just wrote some code, it's working, but like it was hard, you had to try a bunch of different things, um, uh, there were some confusing things to think through. Imagine yourself like one week from having just written this code, like what would you need to know about what you just did to like quickly understand the code you wrote? So this is a little, Kind of, so it's subjective, but anything that was tricky for you to write, good idea to leave yourself a little explanation of, of what it did or, or why the code is the way it is. Because something that's easy to do is to come back to old code and be like, well, this looks weird, and start changing it, not realizing that there's a particular reason why it's done in a certain way, and then you break it, and then you're not sure what's going on. So kind of noting things like that, always a good idea.
code from elsewhere, also a good thing to document. And so if there's some, say, example from class that you like took the code from and then adapted, you just like from, uh, from class on this date. Uh, more commonly, let's say you get started on lab zero, and uh, if you got started before today, I haven't talked about using the math module, uh, and so you uh, went to Dr. Google and asked about the math module. This is a great programming strategy. Um, uh, basically, any kind of how do you do X in Python for any X is definitely worth consulting uh, Google about. Lots of people use Python, lots of examples out there. Uh, what I would like you to avoid is searches where X is the entirety of the lab. So lab one, it's going to be about like uh, the, the prisoner's dilemma, classic game theory problem. Uh, how would like Python code for prisoner's dilemma lab would be something you should not put into Google. You're not going to learn anything by finding like someone who has already completed the assignment and just copying what they did. But any like specific like how do you convert from degrees to radians in Python? Like that's a perfectly fine thing to, to look up. And if you do find some code, then you'd want to leave a comment like from and then copy paste say the, the web address if it's from a particular place on the web. Or if you talk to a lab assistant and they helped you through like got help from so and so. So like code that, that came from elsewhere. Best practice is to, to leave a comment about that as well. The thing that is uh, not worth commenting is basic Python uh, uh, features. So you're going to assume that, that someone reading your code uh, uh, understands Python. So you would not, for example, say assigns assigns current temperature to current temp. Or, and then assigns 80 to hot temp. If the comment is, is literally just like describing this basic thing that Python can do, that's, that's just sort of cluttering up the, the code. Um, not something that you would need to comment. Yes? Is there a time where we shouldn't use comments, or is it a general best practice to comment uh, as, as many things as you can? Uh, so, how, basically, what is too, too much commenting? Is there such a thing? Um, uh, yes, there is such a thing as too much commenting. And, and I would say, if you are writing a comment for every single line, or if you are writing comments that just restate a very basic thing about what the lines do, those you should just, the code is like easier to read without those. Those are not adding anything. Um, but, Kind of beyond that, I think lots like more comments in general better than less, but it is possible to sort of go overboard. Other questions? All right, so I thought what I'd also do now is talk a little bit about getting started on lab zero, just so. Uh, if you weren't sure how to how to get how to get started, uh, to to demonstrate that and and uh, talk through it. So, go to the Lab Zero write up. Um, there's instructions on kind of how to get set up with Python. If you're working on a lab computer, there's nothing to install. Uh, Python or VS Code and all that, they're already there. So that's an advantage to working on, on a lab computer. Uh, working on your, your own computer, uh, you may need to install Python, you may need to install Visual Studio Code. Links to that here. Uh, once you have Visual Studio Code installed, uh, the last step is to go to View Extensions which is this little thing over here, and then search in the extensions for Python and find this Python extension by Microsoft uh, and install that. That is what will let you actually run a Python file 
uh, from VS Code. And once you're, uh, and as I said, the, the computer science lab computers have Visual Studio code and this Python extension already installed. So then uh, you would uh, go to the um, next step of, of the lab. Uh, there's uh, instructions here for uh, how to use the lab computer in a way that won't just uh, destroy your files uh, once, you're, once you're done with them since the lab computers are reset uh, every night. Uh, there is a particular place on the computers, the courses directory, where if you save stuff, it'll stick around and you can access it from any lab computer. You would also put it on Google Drive or Dropbox. Um, you don't have to use this courses directory, but uh, instructions for it are, are here. And so if we go down to the four problems that uh, are posed in the lab, uh, we want to create a, a file lab0.py. And each of the problems is of the form like, here is some, some math you need to do, and then print out, print out the result. So in VS Code, a button to create a new file, lab0.py. The files need to have .py at the end. That's how VS Code knows it's a Python file and will let you run it as a Python file. And then each of these problems kind of gives some kind of gives some initial values and some math that you should have Python do based on those initial values. So in this first one, we have some amount of hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen atoms. We have their molecular weights, and we're just computing the total molecular weight of some molecule that has these atoms in it. And so this will be something like uh, hydrogen equals 22, oxygen uh, equals uh, uh, 11, and carbon equals 12. Yes, that is that was what it said. So we'll have some variables that we'll set up. Uh, I'll probably want to, to comment this like uh, problem one, so I can see kind of this is the code for problem one, and put my name, um, date, and the assignment at the top. And then you'll have some code that actually does the math. And then you'll print out the result with some text. In this case, the molecular weight is that kind of identifies what this number represents. And then it's this little arrow in the upper right that I would click to, I will just assign a variable weight to something so the program doesn't crash. And I click the arrow, it runs it, and it prints it out in this thing called the terminal. And it's kind of a, a text interface for the computer. And that's where I would look to see, uh, see the output. Ask me questions about these steps that I just, just showed. Yes. Um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One, um, this is like a really minute thing just because I already did the lab, but if we just use HCO for the, is that fine? Um, or should we spell it out still? So in general, uh, you will want to avoid one letter variable names. Okay. Uh, just because if I look through a code and the first variable is named A, second is B, third is C, fourth is D, like now I have no idea what A through D is. The one exception is if you are implementing some, say, mathematical formula that has letters in it, I would use those letters as the variable name just so that they match. So for like the area of the triangle one and stuff like that. Exactly. And so in this, like I think chemical formulae often have just like H, C, and O. So in this case, I think that would be fine. 
Um, but particularly if it's not things from a from a formula, I would avoid the, the one letter variable names. And then the second question is how do you get like the code from VS Code to like run, then run so, is that something that we should be doing at all? Uh, yes, you will definitely need to be uh, running your code because that is the only way to determine whether it works uh, before you uh, before you submit. Um, and so, uh, the arrow in the upper right here, clicking that, is how you run the code, and you can see uh, the output that shows up in the terminal. Uh, if this arrow doesn't show up, um, uh, it may be because you don't have Python installed. Um, and you can see in the in the lower right here, I know it's it's very small, but there's something that says Python 3.9.7. So there should be something in the lower left that says Python 3. Point something that tells you which version of Python you're on. And if there isn't anything there or it says no interpreter, then VS Code could not find Python uh, on your on your computer. Um, this arrow will also not show up unless the file has a .py at the end of its name. Uh, and so, particularly if you have any trouble like getting set up, getting Python working, like running some some Python code, um, posting on on the Moodle forms uh, is a great place. Coming to my office hours. Uh, going to Olin 310 and asking a lab assistant, they almost certainly can, can help you out. Emailing Dominic, uh, he, can, he can help you out. And then finally, Mike Tai is the CS department uh, tech guru. Uh, his office is, is uh, right next to mine at the end of the, the hall there in Olin, Olin 335. So he or any of his assistant system administrators um, can absolutely help any sort of setup issues. So you don't, but so then I realize that you don't actually have to go to Python at any point. Like you, if we're doing the homework assignment in VS Code, you don't have to open Python like mm, a separate mm. application. Uh, that's that's right. You you okay. uh, everything we're doing will always be completely within VS Code. Awesome. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. So where would the in the code would the um, computer do the math? Uh, so I have just avoided writing out this entire problem, but it would be like where I have left the the comment, do the math. Like that's where I would do the multiplication by the by the weight and all that. Does that make sense? Other questions? Yes. Sorry, this isn't about the lab, but about the stuff that we're working on now in class. Um, where do we get the time? Like. I'm trying to do it a long way, but like because we don't have the temperature data, it won't run. Um, where would we get it? So on the course calendar, there is a link to temperature. Whether uh, I, I will post the code from class on the calendar. So there's weather.py is there, and also the extremely elaborate temperature.py is there. Uh, what exactly this? Python means is a subject for Wednesday, but if you just download this, call it temperature.py, put it in the same folder as uh, the code you're writing, then that's all. That's all I. That's all I have done to to make this make this work. That there is just this temperature.py in the same folder as my as my weather.py. Awesome. Thank you. Other questions. All right, so for the lab, you will need to uh, use some of the mathematical uh, uh, operations provided by Python. And uh, the way that Python makes these available to you is through something called the math module. So uh, if I wanted to kind of look up, okay, what does this Python math module have? I could search for Python math module, 
and I want to look for something that says like Python documentation. This is like the official documentation from the people that made Python. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a reliable source of information. And listed here are all these different uh, operations that, that math provides to us. So um, I could uh, then search for sign And I found the kind of part that's talking about the trigonometric functions. Um, so I see math.sign uh, returns the sign of x radians. This is one indication that, I, that this input that I provide to sign needs to be in radians. So kind of consulting this documentation is a good way to find out kind of what Python provides to us. So how would I actually use this, this math.sign? So if I go back to um, uh, this, uh, my code, I can say uh, import math up at the top here. I don't need any sort of, like, this, is, this math is built into Python, so I, unlike this temperature thing, which is just a little file that I wrote, you can always just import math. Uh, you don't need anything else to, to make it work. Uh, and then I could say uh, something like math.sign of uh, 1.57 and uh, this would produce the sign of, of this angle in, in radians. Um, and I could, could assign that to uh, a, a variable. Um, could also say, okay, print the square root of 100 math, uh, the, the square root operation um, uh, will print out 10, indeed the square root of 100. Uh, I could also ask it to print out the square root of negative 100. Uh, unfortunately, Python's square root function does not understand taking the, the square root of a negative number, um, and so it, it produces this value error, math domain error, saying that, that the input you gave this function is like outside the, the, the range of inputs that, that this function can handle. Um, we'll talk more about this on Wednesday, but what is going on when we uh, are using these uh, sine and, and square root is Math.square root is something that we call a function. Uh, and as usual, we've borrowed a term from math, and it means something different. So a function in Python is, uh, as I mentioned on that on our, our first day, where we had kind of some steps to, to draw the letter A and I wanted to avoid writing out those steps every single time, I gave them another name. And then I was just going to use that name in multiple places to repeat those steps. So that's what, it, that's what this function is. Like the, the, the makers of Python have written down the code to compute the square root of some number and then given it a name, and we're going to be able to just kind of use these steps uh, over and over again. And so the name of the function, math.square root, the parentheses are how I actually use the function. Or what we refer to as a function call. That just means use the function or do the steps that, that we previously wrote down for what this function does. And then inside the parentheses, we have the inputs, in this case just one, to this function. So our get per temp parens, that was a function. It didn't require any input, so the parentheses were empty. Our math.square root, 
it requires one input, the number to, that we're taking the square root of, and we put that inside the parentheses. We can have functions that take more than one input. Uh, so, for example, there's a built-in round function that is, that's going to let us round numbers in Python. And so, for that, that actually takes two inputs, the number that you want to round and the number of decimal places you want to round it to. So we could say, okay, 10.123 is the first input, and then 1 is the second input. This would produce 10.1. It would take the first input, round it to the number of decimal places that we specified as the second input and give us back the result. What are your questions on this function idea? Yes? Um, so when working with the math module over the weekend, I found something that's like in from, no, hold on, let me read it. It's like from math import star, and it applies it to the whole program, so you don't have to do the math dot square root. Is that an acceptable thing to use in this class? Yes, so it uh, brings up a good point. Uh, that there's a variation on how we can import uh, uh, things. In, uh, if we import math, then we can say math dot whatever and use it as you see here. We can also say from math import square root, and then we could just refer to square root directly without having to put the math dot in front of it. And that's what I did with from temperature import get cur temp. Just let me say get cur temp. So is this an acceptable, acceptable thing to do? Absolutely. Um, we can uh, also say from math import star, which just imports everything from the math module. This I would say to avoid. This, is, this import star is not a great idea just because what if I had another variable in my program named uh, sin sign? Then that's going to overwrite the sign that I imported from math, um, and uh, might cause some some confusion. Um, and so it's just generally better style to explicitly note the things you're importing. You can give it a list separated by commas. So you don't have a have a separate from import uh, uh, for everything. Uh, so I would I would avoid the the import the import star um, uh, in in general. Other questions? All right. So let's do. Um, some practice. I'm going to ask you to work with your neighbors to write a code that does the following. So we're going to have some variable. Let's call it change. For example, we can have change equals 82. And I want to know how many quarters, that's 25 cents, dimes, 10 cents, nickels, 5 cents, and pennies, 1 cent. How many of each of these coins do I need to provide this much change? So to write code that computes how many of each of these I need for, say, 82 cents, and then print that out. There are a couple uh, math operators that I think you will find useful for this task. If I have x 
x equals 12. And if I do x divided by 5, that's going to give me like 2.4. If I do x double slash 5, that's going to do the same division, but throw away the decimal part. That's just going to give me 2. And so when I'm asking, say, like, how many quarters, how many 25s go into 82, forget any, like, partial quarters, this kind of integer division, this division that throws away the decimal part, uh, might be useful. I think you will also find the remainder uh, uh, operator useful as well. Because once we know how many quarters we want, we want the remainder, the change remaining, once we divide it by, say, 25. So if we use this remainder, that's going to be, be helpful for that. So go ahead and, and uh, work with your neighbors uh, to try and write, write code that's going to print out uh, the, the, the coins we, we need to make change. All right, we are almost out of time. So I just want to show you one way to to approach this. Where I have each each time I'm looking for like I have some amount of change. How many times does 25 go into that? And then when I, I can use the remainder to say, OK, what's left over after I take 25 out as many times as I can? And that's remaining. And then I just repeat that with dimes and nickels. Uh, and then pennies is what's ever left over. Uh, so that'll do it for today. Uh, keep working on lab zero. I have office hours in Olin 310 tomorrow evening. Uh, post on the Moodle forums, and I'll see you Wednesday.